Institute of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Gary Wentz, our speaker for the third and, and final time. Well, I hope not the final time. This is the third time he's been on, on campus. He kicked off the 2012 Thailand semester for us, and he also opened the 2014 Turkey semester, as well as the uh, Korea semester. So how could he be an expert on so many countries, you ask? Well, it's quite simple. He's been to so many countries. If you read in the program, he has been to more than 220 countries, colonies, and territories. In fact, I didn't know there were more than 220 countries, uh, <laughs> colonies, and territories. By comparison, I've only been to maybe a mere 25. 220, and he's still going. Uh, his goal is to knock them all off uh, before he's said and done. He still has to hit six in Africa. Africa has 54 countries. He's been to 48. So he's pretty weak in, in Africa. <laughs> That's a, some work to do there. And then the other day, he was kind of listing off, you know, a few of the others. And to be honest, I hadn't heard of a lot of them. Uh, a lot of these are new countries that have just emerged, or they may be a tip of an island and they have declared themselves to be their own sovereign nation. Uh, so, Gary is a professional tour leader. A week from now, he'll be in Burma, getting ready to leave a group of well-heeled tourists uh, on a river cruise. Um, he lives in Los Angeles, but he's hardly ever there. Um, he was telling me he gets back from this tour in Burma on October the 4th, and then October the 5th, he leaves on another tour. So he won't even be at home for 24 hours before he's on the road again. So without further ado, let's welcome Gary Wentz for his talk on religions on the Korean Peninsula. I love hearing uh, Chad's uh, descriptions of my travels. And that makes me uh, realize that I just decided right now, Chad, before I leave for Burma next week, I'm going to end this talk right at time. And I'm heading to the airport to fly to Africa to get one of those other countries off my list. So, religion and spirituality on the Korean Peninsula. I probably don't have to do any background about Christianity or Judaism or Islam to this group. Probably most people here in this audience are monotheists. It's one of the three great Abrahamic traditions of either Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. But uh, to really understand all the religions of Korea, most of us who are of those backgrounds I just mentioned, probably most of us are of Christian background, we don't need a lot of basics about that one, uh, but that actually, Christianity is actually the largest religion now in Korea. How strange, how did that happen? But I don't have to go into the background about that, but I think uh, for us to understand all the religions of Korea, past and present, it doesn't hurt to uh, begin with talking about the origins of those other religions that have been there a lot longer than Christianity. Christianity really shows its face in the late 1700s. Although there are notes of scholars, and Matteo Ricci, the famous Jesuit, who uh, uh, worked amongst the courts of China, and somehow his teachings and notes made it before the 1700s uh, to Korea. Uh, Christianity didn't really begin until the late 1700s. Uh, but uh, let's start at the beginning with um, the two great, I call them the great cultural superpowers of Asia. Who can name for me the two great cultural superpowers of Asia? Who can name the two countries that are the two leading cultural superpowers of all of Asia. Two countries. Some Asian can surely name one, yes. China. China, excellent. What would the other one be, maybe? India. India, there we go. Now we're on track. So 
in the history of Asian religions, it goes back to these two great cultural superpowers. India and China, they had civilizations already defined for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The first religion that we know of in, well actually the first religion in the world, who knows what the first religion in the world was? What's the oldest religion? Way before Judaism, way before the Abrahamic, way before Zoroastrianism. Animism? Animism. You must be in a religions class. You've gotten two answers already. Or are you just a smart person? <laughs> okay. So animism is really the world's first religion. And it's not incorrect of us to be talking about it for a few minutes before we really get into Korea because Korea still has a lot of animism. In fact, we all have a lot of animism. Animism is the belief that there are spirits everywhere. There's spirits in the ground, there's spirits in the sky, there's spirits in the trees, and the stones, and the mountains. And this really is the religion that, that had, was here, really from nature. So let's think of like the Native Americans, for example, still have a lot of animist beliefs. You know, they have a belief that Mother Nature, they have a belief to take care of the earth because that's where our spirit is, and that's why they're fighting like gas pipelines and things, because what about the spirits in the earth? Are we gonna pollute them and so forth? So animism, uh, what, the closest thing we would come to, and it's not a nice word in our lexicon, is uh, paganism. So it's really a belief that there is energy everywhere, and therefore there's spirit everywhere. Think about if you were born 15, 20, 30, 50,000 years ago, when there was no, when there were no established religions, how you would relate to the earth. What would happen when you saw an eclipse? Wouldn't you start like getting humble and say, wow, what's wrong with the God of the sun? You know, have we done something wrong? What did I do? Right? So this is the so these are primitive <coughs> beliefs that really come out of human experience with nature, relating with nature, with the sun and the moon. And these are often considered gods or deities in ancient times. So that's animism, the belief, just broadly speaking, the belief in spirit, somehow energy in the earth related with nature. Uh, so in India, there were two religions that developed after animism, and that was Hinduism, which was been around for five, six, seven, eight thousand years, and Buddhism, which started about 2,500 years ago. And although Hinduism is not found in Korea, except maybe amongst a few IT technicians from Mumbai that are transplanted there, <clears throat> but Buddhism is. It's one of the great religions of Korea historically that came uh, to Korea around the 4th century AD, around uh, something like 372. Um, and that brings us to China, uh, because uh, China is the home, another great cultural superpower. And it's the home of a religion that was kind of founded on animism, and that is Taoism. Sometimes it's spelled with T-A-O, sometimes it's spelled D-A-O. <clears throat> but Taoism is an original religion of China that draws a lot from nature and spirits and believes in forces that we can't see, but you have respect for them. Taoism became a very big religion, and that still has infused so much of Chinese thought today. Like a lot of the martial arts really come from this understanding of energies that we don't see. Uh, you know, a lot of martial arts are based on being attacked and letting it pass by, you know, let the energy pass by you or receiving the energy and using it to twirl around and hit somebody. So it's like taking advantage of mysterious, unseen energies uh, that can be to one's benefit, not necessarily in martial art terms, I'm just using that as an example. But Taoism has been a religion of China before Buddhism uh, came. Uh, but when Buddhism came, remember, who remembers where Buddhism got started? What country? Yeah. India. So the Buddha was actually born in what is today Nepal, but in those days was India. He was born 10 miles from the border of India in current day 
uh, Nepal, in the town called Lumbini, some 550 uh, BC. And Buddhism, after it uh, generated and became the most popular religion, even above the original Hinduism, uh, spread in different directions. So there's what's called the Southern School Buddhism, some call it Hinayana or uh, Theravada Buddhism. This is the Buddhism of the south of Asia, such as Sri Lanka, uh, Burma, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, parts of uh, South Vietnam. Uh, this is called Theravada Buddhism, Hinayana Buddhism. It's the same Buddhism as the Buddhism of the north, that's called Mahayana Buddhism. That's the Buddhism that came around from India through Afghanistan, through Kyrgyzstan, through Tajikistan, through Uzbekistan, through Kazakhstan, across through Xinjiang, Chinese Turkestan today, uh, through the desert, uh, over to Tang Dynasty, China. By 6th, 7th century, Buddhism had become the, the leading religion of China. A little bit before that, like 372, it had really started uh, coming from China, from India, around the first century AD. And in 372, it made it through China and uh, came to Korea. What's interesting about Buddhism, I happen to have personal uh, knowledge of this, because as I travel around the world, I'm very interested in all religions, including my own, which is Christianity. Uh, it's my home religion and the one I always come back to. Uh, but I learned actually that uh, it was explained to me one time, you know, religion, all religions go to the same place. They all go to the top of this mountain. And there's different trails that you can take that go up, but they all bring you to the same place. And with that kind of ecumenical mindset, I approach all my travels around the world. I have studied in mosques, I have uh, meditated in Buddhist temples, I um, gone into Hindu temples and I uh, uh, spent time in these places and studied uh, rather deeply. And so I appreciate them all, but one of the greatest appreciations I have for in Buddhism is Zen Buddhism. I studied that in Japan before ever going to Korea. My first time in Korea was 1975. And I went to a Buddhist temple of the Seon sect that was a Zen Buddhist temple. Now Zen started as Chan Buddhism in China, and then it went through Korea, and then it went to Japan, and then it got refined, as the Japanese are so good at doing, whether it's automobiles or whatever, the Japanese seem to take something and refine it. And they did that with Zen Buddhism, and then some missionaries of Japanese Zen Buddhism they went back to Korea, whence Buddhism had come as a stepping stone from China to Japan, and they founded these monasteries of Japanese Zen Buddhism in Korea. So it's kind of like going one way and coming back, a little bit changed and transformed and uh, perhaps uh, enhanced. And uh, that's the monastery where I studied in. So I studied in a Japanese Zen monastery. I mean, Japanese, I mean, it came from Japan like 500 years ago. And, uh, came back into Korea in a changed form. So Buddhism is another great religion, but uh, who can name another religion from that neighbor, that great huge neighbor of China? What's another religion that came to Korea? Confucianism. So we've already talked about Taoism, Buddhism from China, and also Confucianism. And just like Buddhism, you know, Buddhism isn't really a religion. If you talk to those who are real scholars, they say Buddhism is, it's not a religion. Buddhism is a, it's a, uh, a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's a practice. But they don't really do a lot of gods and things originally. But like all religions, religions evolve, religions change. You know, I always say if, if you... If you dropped Jesus into Vatican's, the Vatican Square and said, this is your church, and see all these guys running around in white lace and red satin, and, and you go, what? 
He never had churches. He never had buildings and basilicas and big pillars. And he had a community. So also, we have to think of all religions have, having changed, sometimes uh, enhancing and endowing. And I'm not uh, criticizing, uh, I'm not trying to criticize the Catholics or any religion. I'm just trying to say things change and things get different from the way the founders had originally uh, thought of them. So also Buddhism now, when you go to a Buddhist temple, you see people bowing down in front of golden Buddha statues, all that stuff, and praying to the Buddha and doing chants. Buddha never did that. In fact, Buddha had to teach it before he died. He, when he could see, he had developed a following. There were thousands of people following, listening to him, and treating him like a god, and bowing down to him. He said, hey, you guys, I can see the handwriting on the wall. After I die, I don't want any statues made of me. I'm just a human being. I'm not a god. Let's get that straight. I am not a god. Don't make any statues of me. Did they listen to him? No. Obviously, they didn't do a very good job of listening to their teacher. So all religions go through changes and evolve and become more prolific and rituals and rites and so forth. So back to Confucianism. Just like Buddhism wasn't really a religion, wasn't intended to be a religion, it's become one, so we call it a religion now. So also Confucianism. Confucianism never was a religion. Confucianism uh, is, is really a, a, a social architecture for organizing society. So Confucianism is really famous for being a patriarchal society. That is, the men run the show. Now, it wasn't a bad idea in the time. It's gotten a lot of cultures, a lot of places. Uh, but the idea was that man is the head of the family. St. Paul said, wives, be obedient to your husbands. That's kind of like Confucian. So the idea is hierarchy. So honor your uh, fathers. Honor your, by extension, your ancestors. Honor your leaders in your society. Be respectful to the people who are managing your lives and your economy. So Confucianism became uh, very well liked by governments. So the Chinese are the ones that, since Confucius also was from China, it was the Chinese emperors who really liked Confucianism. And so also in Korea. So uh, Confucianism became so dominant uh, that there were times when Buddhism was basically not really permitted. It still existed, but it was deeply suppressed. So if we go back in history, starting with the animism, uh, it's interesting that in Korea today, believe it or not, uh, we could say that animism animates uh, the culture of Korea just as much as ever. And it comes out in lots of things. Like say when someone gets sick, they not only might go to the hospital, they might call in a shaman to uh, do a little chanting or to uh, light a little incense and blow it upon a patient in the hopes of healing. So there's still this, this belief, even today, in in spirits and energies, and uh, especially in healing. So animism still shows its face a lot in many cultures uh, related to Korea, so, such as uh, Manchuria and parts of China, uh, Mongolia. I've been in many places in Siberia where shamans uh, still are the leading potentate in terms of spirituality. And people still follow a lot of these little rituals, especially around healing. So animism is interesting because the Korean government doesn't even recognize animism uh, officially as a religion. It's not considered an organized religion. That's because it's not. There, there, there are different sects of uh, animism. The leading one is called Sindo, S-I-N-D-O which might sound to you a lot like the Japanese form of animism, which is Shinto, and in fact it is. So the animism of all the world we've been talking about, so the Japanese have that too. 
And it's uh, worthy to talk a little bit about the relationship of Japan to Korea. And these are two countries that are very closely connected with each other. In history, I've already talked about the flow of Buddhism coming from China through Korea to Japan, then back to Korea in a different form. Um, so also animism uh, was Japan's first religion. And uh, unlike in Korea, where Sindo is not uh, really recognized as an organized form of religion in Japan, Shintoism is one of the two great religions of Japan. And you know, the Japanese are pretty ecumenical-minded, ecumenical -minded too. I, I'm sure most of you have heard of this statistic in Japan. It still holds true today as it has for decades that I've been alive. The statistics are when, they, when the government sends out a census and asks, what's your religion, 80% uh, of <coughs> Japanese check mark Shinto, Shintoism. But something else happens when they're doing that census. When they have the other religions uh, that are down there on the long list, and it comes to Buddhism, 80% of Japanese check mark Buddhism. So 80, this is really true. 80% of Japanese will say they're Shinto, and 80% will say they're Buddhist. In other words, there's some crossover there, quite a lot. And, and that's because these two religions are against each other and they don't have wars with each other and they tolerate each other and uh, it's common like for Japanese to be baptized in Shinto and their funeral rites are done in a Buddhist temple. And they, they want to think twice about that. They go, well, yeah, that's how we do it here in our family. So very different uh, concept. Whereas Korea, is a little bit different than that. If you compare that kind of relationship in, Korea, in Japan to Korea, it's quite different. So animism, although it continues to be a major force, the Korean government, we're talking about the South Korean government, we're not talking much about North Korea in this lecture because North Korea doesn't allow religion. It's not that there are not Christians in North Korea. There are probably quite a few but they can't say it, and so we don't know, but we can only assume. And we do know from refugees that escape, as some of them say, we, we still say prayers together, but we don't tell anybody. And um, also, uh, with, uh, in North Korea, it is an atheist state, so they don't allow religion. You're not allowed to practice religion, but there also, of course, are Buddhists in Korea. I just gave a talk an hour ago about uh, our tour in North Korea, and we were taken to a Buddhist temple. See, we have freedom of religion, here's a Buddhist temple. But you don't see anybody there burning any incense or bowing in front of a Buddhist statue. So it's one token temple they show the tourists to show, oh, no, we have freedom of religion, you know. But they don't. So we're not talking much about North Korean Buddhism, but we are talking about uh, South Korea. And uh, a lot, over one million Christians fled from North Korea. So after the communists took over in 1945, over one million people, that's a lot of people, a lot of people <coughs> fled from the North to the South. In fact, in those days, there were more Christians in the North than in the South. And now, of course, the Christians are the uh, highest statistic of religion in South Korea. So, um, in the history, we were talking about how Buddhism came, but then Confucianism uh, became the religion of the courts, uh, especially during the Joseon time, a dynasty of uh, about a thousand years. And for 500 of those years, they basically suppressed Buddhism. Uh, so out of what used to be 300 temples, there were about 25 temples left. So they didn't eliminate it, but those temples just got quiet. They went up in the mountains, up in quiet, remote areas, and practiced their Buddhism, and the government just kind of let them be. But then the government really stressed Confucianism, and that's because Confucianism was such a great tool for them to do their business as leaders, because Confucianism really respects hierarchy. It really respects patriarchy, and by extension, it really 
respects history, that is, honor your ancestors. When I was a kid in school, I was taught that the Eastern peoples of the earth, that is in Asia, that they worshiped their ancestors. That's the word they used. But actually, in my travels through many Confucian regions of the world, so not just Korea, not just China, but actually all of East Asia is deeply influenced by Confucian ethic of respect for hierarchy, respect for patriarchy. And in all these countries, uh, they honor their ancestors, but they wouldn't call it a worship. And I think the reason why Christians who reported back to their home countries about these religions of Confucianism and so forth, they called it ancestor worship, is because when they would go into people's homes, and this is still true today in Korea and all Confucian lands that are influenced by China as a cultural superpower, in their homes, they will have altars. They would have pictures of great grandma, great grandpa, and their mother and their father. And they have photos and sketches of their ancestors, and they have them on an altar. And even amongst, you know, uh, Vietnam is like 10% Catholic. And I've been in Catholic homes in Vietnam, and there on the table, on their altar, they have a statue to the Blessed Virgin Mary. They have a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And then they got great, great grandma and grandpa up there. And um, so they're all on the altar. Uh, so it's interesting that um, they don't think of it as honoring gods. These are just honoring their great grandparents and being respectful of those who came before them and gave them their life and a lineage of respect. So uh, Confucianism can be defined uh, negatively if you are not of a tolerant mind, or you can say, well, that's all part of, uh, uh, is it one of the Ten Commandments? Honor thy father and thy mother. So they just, they just like really honor them, like every day, like burn a candle or burn a stick of incense before great, 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 great grandma and grandpa. So uh, during this 500 year period of uh, really suppression of Buddhism, the Confucians were in their heyday. And now uh, Confucianism doesn't even rate on the stats uh, of the censuses when they take censuses. I'd like to tell you uh, something about the censuses that are coming out today. But before I do that, let's spend a little time on a late arrival religion which has taken over and wins the top of the statistics, and that, I mentioned that's Christianity. So we know the Catholics uh, were started here officially that year is 1794. And then in the 1800s, uh, Protestants started arriving, different kinds of missionaries of Protestantism. The leading Protestant groups today are Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists. There's also Mormons and uh, the mega evangelical churches and so forth. Uh, but these uh, Protestant groups started arriving in the 1800s. And around 1880, the late 1800s, they moved in big time. And that's because there was a cultural change happening. The old dynasties of Joseon are getting old and run down and corrupt, and they're the ones that were using Confucianism as their model to rule. And people are getting tired of that, and they're feeling like they're getting called by the outside Western world as the hermit kingdom already back in the 1800s because they were so backwards. And um, it kind of reflects and mirrors what was happening, and again, the comparison to Japan in the Meiji period. So 1868 marks the Meiji period in Japan, when Japan realizes they're backward and they need to look out to the Western world and gain from technology and gain from new outlooks and philosophies. There was an interest in going outwards, and that's when the first missionaries really started being welcomed in Japan. So also in the late 1800s, that same kind of mentality uh, was infused into uh, Korea. And the elite and the intellectuals of Korea at the time, seeing that their country had become kind of old fashioned and was not modernized when they heard about the rest of the world. Some people who went and travel would come back from Paris and say, You can't believe you know, what it's like in Europe and how advanced they are and so forth. 
So there became a, a longing and a yearning and a looking out to the West, including religion, because they said, well, there must be something about these Christians. Why are they so advanced in technology? They must have a pretty good religion that's uh, energizing them. And so they, they, the, the governments said those in the late 1800s actually opened their doors and invited and welcomed missionaries to come in. They were saying, please come to our country. And they thought this would be good also because if the missionaries were there, they could learn from the missionaries, not just learn these new religions, but also learn about how to modernize. What did it mean to modernize? How do you learn about these things? Uh, so uh, there became a huge flow at that time. And so from the 1800s on, we see a growth of uh, not only Catholicism, but also the Protestant sects of Christianity uh, really uh, up to almost the present time, until about the year 2000. And then we see the statistics starting to go down. Uh, now let's move to where does Buddhism stand in that? Buddhism also had a revival. So after these Confucian uh, dynasties had quit their repression, Buddhism had a great revival, and Buddhism also came back in, in um, uh, very popular in uh, the past years since the late 1800s. And, uh, all through the first part of, all through really all the 20th century. Uh, Buddhism has also come back uh, with great gains. Uh, but there's, um, they're also in recent years starting to go down. So we're seeing a, a new trend, new changes in Korea. They've become modernized now. They've got all that new uh, fangled stuff from the West. And now religion seems to be fading away. And it also has to do with uh, certain corruptions that have been happening in uh, the religions. But uh, now I'd like to give you statistics from, this is from 2015. Where, where, who, how many are there of this and that? So, and this is where the Christians come out ahead. If you combine uh, the Catholics and the Protestants, the Christians are definitely ahead. Uh, there are uh, 19, and this is 2015 census, 19.7% of the population are Protestants. 7.9% are Catholics. So together, that forms a plurality. That is, the, the greatest, largest group of any religion of Christians is Catholics and Protestants combined. Because the only other religion now that's considered a religion uh, in uh, Korea is Buddhism. And they are at 15.5%. So they, uh, they, after Christians, they're a, a distant second if you combine the, the two Christian main groupings. Uh, but we, what about the animists? Where are they? And the government actually has no statistics on animists because they don't consider it an organized religion. And yet, uh, animism is everywhere. But you know, they're not known for making mega churches and they're not known for being organized. It's just you call your neighborhood shaman when Uncle, Uncle Kim is feeling ill and you call him in for some prayers and chants and burn some incense sticks. And so that's their animism. So, Animism is alive and well, amazingly, how this, this belief in the spirits has continued. It's alive and well, but it's not statistically uh, in, the, uh, in the census. Now, here's a problem with this census. They, what, the bottom line is, there's probably, the Protestants probably come out better on the census than they should. Um, it, and so they may not be quite as strong, and the Catholics don't come out quite as strong as they should. Uh, so what does that mean? That's because the, son, the last census we have in 2015 on these statistics of the different religions, uh, first of all, was an internet census. So uh, they sent out, you know if you know this, uh, Korea is very wired. Korea is possibly the most advanced wired, you know, access to Wi-Fi and internet in the whole world. It's a, the 12th largest economy in the world and the, their, their economy is IT. 
Uh, so they are way up there. And so the last census they did was, they called it a sampling. So the sampling was to 20% of households in Korea. And then those are the statistics they got back. 19.7 uh, Protestant, 7.9 Christian, 15% Buddhist. But in that census, they didn't say, are you animist? So you see, we're already we have totals that are less, uh, you know, out of that 19.7, who does math here? 19.7 plus uh, the 7.9% Catholics plus the 15% Buddhists, that's less than 50% of the population. But those are the three majority religions with the Protestants having the, and Catholics, Christians having the plurality. So what about these other ones? So while well, animism isn't in there because, well, it's not really an organized religion. So that would explain where, where is this other 56%? That's what the total is. There's 56% that are unaccounted for. So a lot of sociologists who study this say, well, for sure, we can say a lot of that 50, 60%, it's not that they're non-believers. It's just that they don't uh, owe themselves to a religion. They don't claim that they are Catholic or Protestant. They actually might be <coughs> Protestant. They might be evangelical. They might, but they're not, they're not claiming it. So they think a good percentage of these people, they're actually religious. And they think about 15% of the population are really people that don't have a religion like as in atheism or agnostic. So the bottom line is, of all Korea, about 15% have no religion. So all the rest actually are religious, even though they don't claim it. And another reason for this census not being completely accurate is, although Seoul and the big cities are well-wired, not everybody in the countryside has access to internet. I stay on a farm in Indiana every summer, and uh, I have to bike into town to get on the internet because they don't have cable out there, and it's too costly to order satellite service. So even in the U.S., not everybody's wired, even if they would like to be. Uh, so I've got to bike four miles into town every time I have to check my email. Um, but in Korea, we have to remember that even though it may be the most wired country in the world, it's not completely wired, it's not totally wired, and so we have to think about those people out in the countryside. So a lot of those people out in the countryside are not Protestant. The Protestants tend to be in the cities. And even uh, the Catholics tend to be more in the countryside. And the elderly are in the countryside. So just as in the U.S. we have a lot of people down on the farm and all the young people go into town, uh, and the elderly people are not on internet, so they're not answering this sample survey. So there's a lot of factors that make these statistics to be a little bit not quite uh, fully illuminating the total picture. So uh, you have, first of all, rural population that's not getting on the internet to fill out the sample. Uh, then you've got uh, elderly people who are not, haven't ever used a computer and never will. Um, and so those also affect those statistics. Um, how much time do we have? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Is that, is that until the end? Yeah. <laughs> well, what, but uh, question time. OK, I'll do this really quick. So I do want to mention uh, some interesting things just quickly. I can do this in two minutes about the megachurches. Now, we, we all know what megachurches are. Who's this guy in Dallas? <laughs> Austin or something? Anyway, a mega church in America is like, there's like 25,000 people that go to this church and it holds like 15,000 at a time. And, and, and these are prosperity churches. Usually the pastors are people preaching, uh, if you're a good Christian, God will reward you with many good prosperous things and you know that thing. So they get, they get lots of people uh, interested in that form of, if you want to call that Christianity, that form of religion. Mega churches. So, out of all the mega churches in the world, six of the top ten are in South Korea. So these are Protestant, prosperity-oriented mega churches. The top six, the biggest ones in the world, are in Korea. 
And the reason why statistics are going down for on the Protestant quotations of the census is because the some of the pastors have been found who've been corrupt and they've been busted and are now in jail for having embezzled huge amounts of money. Kind of makes sense of prosperity pastor. It's interested in making some extra money on the side. So these guys, are, uh, these churches now are getting a bad reputation and they're losing members very quickly. So actually since the year, especially since the year 2011, when like the leading pastor of the biggest mega church was found to have absconded with millions and millions of dollars. And this was splashed across the newspapers and the media and so forth. Um, that population of census now is uh, going down. Okay, we still got five minutes for questions. Any questions? Any questions about Confucianism, animism, Buddhism? Yes? Are they um, converting? Um, I lived in Tahoe here in Puerto Rico. One of the biggest problems at that time was it didn't have enough bribes for the Korean Muslims. So they went into Vietnam and other similar countries and brought back the younger brides. And one of the major churches I participated in, we came up with projects of knitting to give these women a skill because they did not have language skills. So what I'm wondering is there were many brides uh, who came in and uh, did they, were they converted? I mean, where are we putting this group of young and, like I said, not quite middle-aged women who become uh, the brides, uh, where do they fit in? Right, I, I got your question. Yeah. And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but I do know this phenomenon, that is, of, uh, because there's a shortage of, and this goes back to Confucianism. You know, in China, there's a shortage of women. women right. And now there's a shortage of women in Korea because everybody wants to have a boy because it's Confucianism. You know, you got to have a boy in the family. Uh, and so there's a shortage of women. And, and now there's even a greater shortage because there's this competition with this country called China, which is 1.3 billion people with a huge shortage of women because of infanticide of girls and so forth. And so they're going down to countries, other countries that are similar. There's a reason why they're getting them out of Vietnam. Because Vietnam it, it has women <laughs> and, uh, and they're Confucian. So remember, uh, Vietnam mirrors a lot of the society because it's part of that super, uh, that super power of culture of China. So remember that for a thousand years, Vietnam used to actually be a part of China. It was like a deep southernmost part of China, just like all these countries around China. Korea used to be controlled by China off and on over its time. They're always fighting off the Chinese. You know, sometimes the Chinese are dominating, sometimes not. The same was true in Korea. So they had that same phenomenon. Which makes them attractive because they makes them attractive because they're closer to that culture than if you say go to Micronesia and try to get some girls off an island in Micronesia or something. But I don't know uh, how those statistics uh, are incorporated. My guess is if they came from Vietnam. They're either uh, Catholic, Buddhist, or Confucian because <laughs> that's what we're. That's, that's, Vietnam is 10% Catholic and about 80 some percent Jews. And while they tended to, at least when I was there, to pride themselves on being totally Korean by bringing in the new strain of the other cultures and other bloodlines, this means that less purity of the Korean race is now there. Yeah. But if you want to get married, you got to do that. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you said there were the top six nations were in Korea. What are the religions for them? Are they all the same? Well, they all are Protestant churches, just like our mega churches here. They're all Protestant churches. But not necessarily, they're not like Baptist or Presbyterian, kind of like their own evangelical type. <coughs> but with a prosperity attraction. Yes? But now the change still exists. As a book, yes, by uh, Lao Tzu of China, yes, uh, and uh, I, I know that there must be groups of Taoists, but you never hear anything of them. Uh, where are they? Are 
You're talking about the Taoists in Korea or the Taoists in China? Well, in, in both. Okay, because it is the same religion in both. So remember, as China is one of those great superpowers of Asia, Taoism was really their first religion after animism, before Buddhism came. And uh, Taoism is still around. I've been to Taoist temples in China and in Korea. And where you find Taoist temples, even though they're not as organized, but you'll find shrines, like at holy places, again, having to do with nature. You'll find them at the base of mountains. You'll find them at the top of mountains. For example, the most, if you were at the, this morning's talk, we are talking about sacred mountains of Korea. So there's a, the most sacred mountain in Korea is in the north mountain called Diamond Mount, Kundang Mountain. That's the most sacred mountain, religiously speaking, to, to all Koreans, whether you're Buddhist, Confucianist, that's a sacred mountain, and to Taoists or animists. And so also the most sacred mountain in the north is right on the border of the, of, uh, the, the uh, 38 parallel. It's called Soroksan. And I've hiked that mountain. I've climbed to that mountain top. And all along the way there are Shinto shrines. So they're out there. Uh, we just don't hear about them because they're not as organized as a church. One last question. Is that um, okay, Chad? Can you do one last one? Okay. How do you think uh, Islam has like came into uh, South Korea? Like, how did that start started over okay, there? Okay. Well, first of all, there's not a lot of Muslims. There's only a hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Now there are, uh, and most of those, a majority of those, are people who are there, uh, not as Koreans, but they're residents or workers. So they, maybe they're IT people from India, because you know. A couple hundred million Indians are Muslim, even though the majority of religion is Hindu. There's a lot of Muslim Indians, and a lot of those guys in tech, and they're helping make you know Korea the most wired. Uh, so that that's some of them. But there are native Koreans who are Muslim, and this would be because maybe in their families they travel. For example, there's a lot of Koreans in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. There's a lot of Koreans there because they were moved there by uh, Stalin uh, during the 1930s. And those people, because those were Muslim countries, some of those people maybe married Muslim and they, they weren't allowed to marry unless they converted to Islam because that's one of the rules of Islam. If you're going to marry a Muslim, you've got to join that religion. And then maybe they moved back to Korea. That's why there's not many of them. A total of 150,000 Muslims, in, including those temporary residents as well as those kinds of examples of people that were from Korea, moved to other places, came back with that religion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.